Amen. Welcome to the Gathering Church. For those that are here in the auditorium or those that may be watching online, God bless you. I'm excited to dive into the Word of God this evening. I pray that you all have been enjoying your summers up to this point, enjoying the sunshine, enjoying the opportunity to get out. But I'm excited to dive into the Word. Uh, I want to talk to you this evening as the youth are making their way out, I want to talk to you this evening for the next few minutes on a sermon that I've titled, The Ornament of Obedience. The Ornament of Obedience. Webster's, Webster's Dictionary defines the word ornament as the act of adorning or being adorned. Webster's Dictionary defines the word ornament as the act of adorning or being adorned. And to adorn simply means to enhance the appearance of a person, a place, or a thing, especially with beautiful objects. To adorn something means to enhance the appearance of a person, a place, or a thing, especially with beautiful objects. And so there's this idea that I can take something regardless of its current state or condition. I can take something regardless of its appearance, regardless of its countenance. I can take something regardless of its health. It doesn't matter how dry it is. I can take something. It doesn't matter how old it is. It doesn't matter how, how broken something is. It doesn't matter how, how damaged or how mangled or how imperfect something is. It means that I can take these ornaments and begin to adorn this thing, thereby enhancing its appearance and its beauty. And that's the purpose and that's the power of, of an ornament. You can take what others may have deemed as youth, useless or what others may have deemed as worthless. You can take what others have discarded and what other people have, have left for dead, what others have written off and, and counted as worthless and counted out. And as you begin to adorn this thing with ornaments, it begins to all of a sudden exude light. This thing that you begin to adorn with ornaments, it begins to exude beauty. It, it radiates elegance and refinement. And as I was putting this sermon together, I was reminded of a passage of scripture that speaks to the beauty of what Jesus came to do in our life. After Jesus, the Christ, was, was tempted in the wilderness by Satan, he returns to Galilee where he begins his ministry. And the Bible declares that he returns to, to Nazareth, and as he goes to the synagogue, he's, he's handed a scroll or a book. And it just so happens to be the book of the prophet Isaiah. And trust me when I say this, there's, there's no coincidence. There's, there's, this is an happenstance that he's handed this book or the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And he opens it, he unscrolls this thing, and he reads this passage from Isaiah 61. And it says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness. The planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. The Bible goes on to declare in Luke, the fourth chapter in the 20th verse, that, that Jesus closes the book mid-passage. He's, he's in the middle of reading Isaiah 61, and he, he closes it mid-passage, and he begins to say to them that today is the day that the scriptures are fulfilled that you are hearing. It was as if Jesus was saying, yes, yes, I've come so that my blood could be sprinkled on the mercy seat of the ark. Yes, I've come to tear the veil that, that separated the inner court from the holy of holies. Yes, yes, I've come to redeem man and to, to pay the ultimate ransom with the ultimate sacrifice. But, but I've also come as an ornament for your life. Jesus says, Jesus says the dry places. 
the broken places of your life, the dead places in your life, the dreams that have gone unfulfilled, the, the visions that haven't yet come to pass. I've come to adorn your life, Jesus says. And what you thought and what you counted as lifeless. And what you thought was deceased, what you thought was, was motionless and, and in a comatose state. He says, I'll begin to adorn it with the presence of the living God. And that's why he said in John 16 and 7, that, nevertheless, I, I say to you, it is expedient, meaning it, it's necessary, it's, it's vital, it's, it's beneficial that I go away. Jesus says, for if I go not away, the, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. Jesus says, yes, salvation and, and reconciliation of, of man to God was the purpose. Yes, that's why I left my perfect seat in heaven. Yes, that's why I said, God, Father, I'll go. He says, but it's imperative that I go because when I leave, you can begin to experience the adorning of the Spirit of God in your life. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can revive and resuscitate what we deemed as dead. The Holy Spirit is the only one that can breathe new life and breathe fresh life on, on what we've suffocated and, and what we've exhausted. He's the only one that can give us beauty for ashes. He's the only one that can refresh what we've depleted in our lives and adorn us with a beauty that we never thought was possible. As I started to study, as I started to, to put together the pieces of this sermon, I started to think about my dear mother who had a knack for, for decorating her Christmas tree every year. Her trees looked like they came straight out of a out of a magazine or something. They were pristine and they were they were perfectly arranged and every ornament was strategically placed. But if you would have seen the tree when she brought it home, if you would have seen what it looked like when she when she carried it off the top of her car, you you would have questioned just like I did, Mama, 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 why'd you pick this tree? Of all the trees that were available, Mama, why, why this tree right here? Doesn't seem like it's a good fit for the living room, Mama. There seems to be some pieces missing, Mama. There's some there's some gaps. It doesn't it doesn't look full, Mama. Why is it why is it leaning the way that it's leaning, Mama? Why, why did you pick that one? Look at look at the branches, Mama. I don't think the top is is made for the star that we want to crown it with, Mama. Why of all the trees that you could have picked in the city, why did you pick this tree right here? And it was a tree that was undoubtedly picked over. A tree that was blemished and, and imperfect, a tree that was that was picked over and that was cut down, a tree that was that was ultimately left for dead. And I couldn't help, I couldn't help but to think that this is exactly what, what Christ came to do in our lives. And while some have questioned the purpose and the calling on your life. And if we're honest with ourselves, some of us have questioned the own purpose and the calling on our lives. And while others have said that we aren't, aren't good enough, and while others have said that we don't have what it takes, well, some have said that we're, we're missing what's needed, that, that we aren't smart enough, that we aren't pretty enough, that we aren't good enough, that we aren't skilled enough, that we don't know enough, that we haven't been around long enough. Just like my mother would say, I believe that Christ came to silence the doubters and the naysayers by saying, just watch. The same way after I finished nagging about mama picking the tree that she did, I, I believe that Christ the same way said, just watch. Just wait and see. I, I, I know it doesn't look like much right now, Keenan, but, but just give it some time. Just watch. I know, I know that there are imperfections and, 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 and the imperfections in the lives of some of the people are, are glaring, but, but just watch. I know 
Jesus is saying, I, I know I don't I know it doesn't look like I'll I'll be able to pull it off with them, Keenan. I, I know it doesn't look like I'll be able to, to pull it off in your life, but but I need you to just watch. And I wonder if there's anybody here this, this evening or that's watching online who's grateful for the fact that Christ came into your life and just said, just watch. Grateful that he came into your marriage when he did and said, just watch. Grateful that he came into the trauma and the abuse that you experienced and he said, just watch. Yeah, yeah, grateful that he saw the failures and the setbacks and the disappointments and he said, just watch. Grateful that he saw the health condition. Grateful that he saw the addiction when he did. Grateful that he saw the, the suicidal thoughts. Grateful that he saw the mess that I made. Grateful that he saw it all when he did, and, and he didn't give in to what others have been saying about me. He didn't give in to what others were saying about you and, and the condition that your life was in. But, but Jesus came just to say, just watch. Just wait and see what I can do with him. Just wait and see where I'm going to take her. I know it doesn't look good right now. I, I know the, the mess that she's in is, is a bit bad, but just watch and see. I know her life is leaning a little bit. I, I know there's some gaps in there. I know that there's some room for some holiness, but, but give it some time. Just watch. Thankful and grateful that Jesus, as I, as I made my way, looking for trees, Stepping over some, looking for the perfect tree. I'm grateful that, that Jesus didn't step over me looking for the perfect one. Grateful that he picked me up in the mess that I was in. In the condition that I was in. In the trauma that I was dealing with. In the abuse that I was going through. In the hurt that I was holding on to. That he didn't step over me looking for something perfect. He just said, just watch. And he carried me home and he began to adorn me. And he began to strip me and, and prune me. And he began to put me back together the way that he ultimately designed me to be. And I can guarantee you that if you just allow him, he'll do the same thing for you. That he'll see the mess that you're in right now. And rather falling for the trick of the enemy, he'll pick you up and carry you back. And the entire time he'll be saying, just watch. Just watch. Just wait and see what I can do with him. Just wait and see where I'm going to take him. Just wait and see how the trajectory of his life is, is going to be changed because he allowed me to carry him. Too many times, mom, 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 why, why this tree here? Kobe, just watch. Just wait and see. Just wait and see what I'm able to do with this thing. And Jesus is saying the same thing in our lives today. Marriages that we've given up on. Relationships that we've left for dead. Dreams and ambitions and goals that God specifically gave us that we said are never possible now. Jesus says, just watch. Just watch. Just wait and see what I can do if you just allow me to carry you. And that's the God that we serve. Turn with me in your Bibles. If you have them to the book of Joshua, the sixth chapter. And I believe it'll be on the screen behind us if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. And I want to spend the rest of my time this evening talking about the ornament of obedience. The ornament of obedience. And I want to start by setting the stage for where Joshua and the children of Israel are at this particular time in history. At this time that we find them in Joshua, the sixth chapter, Moses, the servant of God, is dead. The great leader of Israel is dead. In fact, everyone who was over a fighting age that walked in the wilderness is dead. Save Joshua and Caleb because of their sin and because of their rebellion against God. At this time that we find them in Joshua, the sixth chapter, the Israelites have already crossed over the Jordan River. 
They've already made their way across the Jordan River the same way that God parted the Red Sea so that the Israelites could cross over on dry ground. God did the same exact thing when they made their way to the Jordan River. God, God spoke to Joshua and told him exactly what to do. I want the priests to carry the Ark of the Covenant into the Jordan. And as soon as their foot touches the Jordan, I'll stop the waters from flowing so that the children of Israel can cross over on dry ground. And when they crossed over the Jordan River, they are now, they're now in the promised land. The children of Israel are in a land that's flowing with milk and honey. They've now achieved and made their way to the promise that, have been, that has been spoken about since the days of Abraham. And I've got to read what the Bible says in Joshua chapter 5, verse 10, because not enough is said about this transition of provision. Here they are now. The children, children of Israel, have, they've crossed over the Jordan River. They've made their way into the promised land. This is the land that they've been, been talking about. This is the land that they've been, been dreaming about. And here they are. But I want to read what the Bible says in Joshua chapter 5, verse 10. It says, while the Israelites were camped at Gilgal, on the plains of Jericho, they celebrated Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the first month. The very next day began to eat unleavened bread and roasted grain harvested from the land. No manna appeared on the day they first ate from the crops of the land. And it was never seen again. So from that time on, the Israelites ate from the crops of Canaan. No manna appeared on the day they first ate from the crops of the land, and it never was never seen again. So from that time on, the Israelites ate from the crops of Canaan. Manna is no longer falling from heaven. For over 40 years, the Israelites have been fed by manna that has fell from heaven. And it's what they were accustomed to and used to. Children that were born during this time, all they knew was manna. All they've ever tasted was manna. The only provision that they ever saw provided was that which fell from the heavens. And they had a specific instructions on what they could pick up and how much they could pick up and what was going to happen the next day. This is all they've ever known. And the moment they cross over into, into Canaan, the Bible declares that they ate from the crops of the land and manna fell no more. But as I was thinking about this, what this passage lets me know is that while the mechanism may have changed, the provision never stopped flowing. The mechanism from which God provided for the children of Israel may have changed, but the provision never stopped flowing. And I couldn't help but to think, I couldn't help but to wonder how some of us are waiting on the blessings of God to flow in our lives. And all he wants you to do is recognize that you've entered a new season. God says you're, you're waiting for the blessings to flow, but, but I need you to recognize that you've crossed over and you've now entered into a new season. God says with, with new season comes change. But just because the mechanism has changed, just because the method has changed, it doesn't mean that the flow of God's provisions in your life has stopped. And so we can't get comfortable. We can't get so used to how God has, has provided us for us in the past because we'll miss what God is trying to do in the present. If I'm so stuck on the way that God has blessed me in the past, I'll miss what God is trying to do in my life now. And we've seen it countless times in the Bible. Over and over and over again, God told Elijah to go down to the Kareth Brook and that he'd, he'd command the ravens to, to bring him a, a meal every day for, for breakfast and for dinner. And he told him to drink from the Kareth Brook. The Bible declares that the ravens brought Elijah bread and meat in the morning. I'm sitting there and trying to envision this at my desk, that the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and they brought him bread and meat in the evening and God told him to drink from the Kareth brook for nourishment but at one point in time the Kareth brook dries up and so if all Elijah was used to or stuck on was being provided by the ravens in the Kareth brook then, then he would have died he would have starved right there 
And I can't but imagine how many of us are malnourished and starving and dying because we're so used to going to this one place. We're so used to this one brook flowing. And God says, I've got something else in store for you. God says, just because the carrot brook is dry doesn't, doesn't mean that the provision will stop flowing. And so he sends Elijah to the house of a widow, and because of her obedience to the man of God, her jar of oil never runs dry, and her, her jar of flour never empties. We can't overlook the fact, we can't overlook the fact that God used a raven, a bird that was deemed unclean in, in cultural standards to provide breakfast and dinner for his prophet. Because some of us, some of us, some of us have rejected the method of blessing in our lives and the provision because we've determined it to be a cultural no-no. We've determined it to be unclean. But God says, this is the very way that I've chosen to bless you. But that's another sermon for another day. Back to the children of Israel. So we find them here in chapter 6. And I need to say this because it's important to grasp. It's important that we understand this now, that the presence of God's promise, the presence of God's promise does not equate to the absence of Satan's schemes. The presence of God's promise in your life does not equate to the absence of Satan's schemes. In other words, just because you grab a hold of God's promise, it, it doesn't mean that you're immune to confrontation. Just because you've seen the promises of God manifested and fulfilled in your life, it doesn't mean that life is just a bed of roses now. It doesn't mean that you won't have hardships. It, it doesn't mean that you won't have conflict. It, it doesn't mean that you won't have confrontation. What it does mean that God is true to his word. It does mean that I can stand on the fact that if God said it, that his promises are yes and amen. But what we tend to do, oftentimes, and I've been guilty of it as well, what we, what we tend to do is get the blessing and then we stop praying. That's what most of us tend to do. We, we get the healing and we forget about the power of worship. We, 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 we get the deliverance and we forget what it means to just sit at the feet of Jesus and just allow him to pour into my life and allow the Holy Spirit to nourish and, and comfort me in ways that I didn't even know I needed. We secure the contract. We do well on the job interview. And all of a sudden, we don't know what it means to, to find our Bible. Well, we, don't, we don't know what it means to consecrate. We don't know what it means to set ourselves aside. We don't know what it means to fast and to pray. Because what I know to be true is that our prayer lives look a whole lot different when we're in need of a breakthrough. You can lie to me all you want. What I know to be true is that when you're in need, when your body is hurting, when your marriage is falling apart, when your children are, are running farther away from God than you could ever imagine, when the job isn't going the way that you thought that it would, when money is running short, what I, what I do know is that our prayer life changes when we need God. Tell me what you want to tell, lie to yourself even. What I know to be true is that when I'm in need of a miracle, when I'm in need of deliverance, when I'm in need of a breakthrough, oh, I know how to get down on my knees and pray. When life, when life is hanging in the balance, you don't have to tell me what time church starts. You don't have to ask me when we're having Bible study or, or when the next prayer meeting is. Oh, because I'm in need of something from God. do know is that our time in the word, our time in the word looks a whole lot different when I'm in need of a blessing and we fall into the trap of the enemy. Listen, we fall into the trap of the enemy when we allow our wish list to dictate our worship. We fall into the trap of the enemy. When I allow my wish list to dictate my worship, and I'm only waving a hand, and I'm only present, 
and I'm only singing, and I'm only willing to pray, and I'm only willing to show up when I've hit rock bottom. I'm only willing to go the distance when things are hanging in the balance. I'm, I'm only willing to show up when, when, I, when things are so out of control in my life. I don't have the power to manipulate it or, or control it on my own. So now I'll, now I'll show up because I'm in need of something. And so here we are. The children of Israel, have, they've crossed over the Jordan River. They've stepped over on dry land into the Jordan River. They're, they're eating off of the good of the land, the land that's flowing with milk and honey. And, and within days of entering Canaan, God says it's time to fight. And again, I need you to know that just because you've walked into your blessing, just because you've walked into your promise, it doesn't mean that there still isn't an obligation to fight. In fact, when I grab a hold of the blessing, I really better know how to pray. Because you grab a hold of the promise doesn't make you immune to confrontation. And the enemy knows he's seen, he's studied long enough. I told you, the, he's as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He understands the patterns and, oh, I just can't wait till she gets the job because she's going to stop praying. I can't wait till that big contract goes through because I know they ain't showing up. And what happens is we make ourselves so vulnerable we give ourselves easy. We give the enemy easy access. It's an inroad. All he needs is for God to bless us. And I wonder why God hasn't opened up some doors yet. I wonder why some things are still hanging in the balance because he knows that if we got it, it would destroy us. Not because the blessing is bad, but we can't handle being blessed in that manner. I can't handle that amount of money. I can't handle that blessing. I can't handle that house because why? If I get it, I'll stop praying. If I get it, I'll start walking in pride and thinking I did it on my own. There's so some humility in that. There's some things we all know that God has promised that hasn't come to pass yet. And it's not because he's a liar, because God is not a man that he should lie. He says his word won't return until him null or void. And, and so if the promises of God haven't been fulfilled in my life yet, then I need to understand why. And God, it's not that I'm trusting you, but show me me. God, show me the areas of my life that need to be worked on, that need to be refined so I can walk in the fulfillment of everything that you promised for my life. That's a scary question to ask. God, show me me. God, show me me. God, I know what you said about my life. I know what you declared. I know the doors that you said would open. I, I know the business that you said would launch and, and the sub-businesses that will launch. I know the things that you promised over my life and, and the, 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 the nations of the earth that will be blessed through the ministry that you've given me. God, why hasn't it happened yet? You ask earnestly enough. Submit yourself and spend some time at the feet of God. I, I believe he'll begin to show that he'll walk you through the, refi the fire that it takes to refine yourself enough to grab a hold of what he wants to bless you with because that isn't God's concern. The stuff isn't God's concern. The stuff that we place so much value in isn't God's concern. It's our commitment and dedication to him that's the problem. It's not that he's incapable of blessing you. God yeah, could breathe on your left right now and open doors that you didn't even think were possible. So here we are. Chapter 6 of Joshua, starting at verse 1. And we're going to read the entire chapter. And so sorry, not sorry. Um, but we will read the entire chapter. I'll give you a few points and I'll take my seat. This is what the Bible says in Joshua, the sixth chapter, starting at the first verse. Now, the gates of Jericho were tightly shut because the people were afraid of the Israelites. No one was allowed to go in or go out or in. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king and all its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. On the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times. 
with the priest blowing the horns. When you hear the priest give one last blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can. Then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. There's something incredible I want to share with you all in just a little bit about that verse 5. When the Bible says, then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. The Bible says, so Joshua called together the priests and said, take up the ark of the Lord's covenant and assign seven priests to walk in front of it. Each carrying a ram's horn. Then he gave orders to the people to march around the town and the armed men will lead the way in front of the ark of the Lord. After Joshua spoke to the people, the seven priests with the ram's horn started marching in the presence of the Lord, blowing the horns as they marched and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed behind them. Some of the armed men marched in front of the priests with the horns and some behind the ark with the priests continually blowing the horns. Do not shout. Don't even talk, Joshua commanded. Not a single word from any of you until I tell you to shout, then shout. So the ark of the Lord was carried around the town once that day and then everyone returned to spend the night in the camp. Joshua woke up early the next morning and the priests again carried the ark of the Lord. The seven priests with the ram's horns marched in front of the ark of the Lord, blowing their horns. Again, the armed men marched both in front of the priests with the horns and behind the ark of the Lord. All this time, the priests were blowing the horns. On the second day, they marched around the, they marched around the town once and returned to the camp. They followed this pattern for six days. On the seventh day, the Israelites got up at dawn and marched around the town as they had done before. But this time, they went around the town seven times. The seventh time, as the priest sounded the last horn, a blast on their horn, Joshua commanded the people, shout for the Lord has given you the town. Jericho and everything in it must be completely destroyed as an offering to the Lord. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and the others in her house will be spared, for she protected the spies. Do not take any of the things set apart for destruction. Only you yourselves will be completely, or only you yourselves, or you yourselves will be completely destroyed, and you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into his treasury. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horn, they shouted as loud as they could. Suddenly, the walls of Jericho collapsed, and the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. They completely destroyed everything in it with the swords, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, goats, and donkeys. Meanwhile, Joshua said to the two spies, keep your promise. Go to the prostitute's house and bring her out along with all of her family. The men who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, brothers, and all of the other relatives who were with her. They moved her whole family to a safe place near the camp of Israel. Then the Israelites burned the town and everything in it. Only the things made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron were kept for the treasury of the Lord's house. So Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute and her relatives who were with her in the house because she had hidden the spies Joshua sent to Jericho. And she lives among the Israelites to this day. At that time, Joshua invoked this curse. May the curse of the Lord fall on anyone who tries to rebuild the town of Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn will he lay its foundation. At the cost of his youngest son, he will set up its gate. So the Lord was with Joshua. And if you go back and read your Bible, you'll see that this very thing happened. Someone laid the foundation of the city of Jericho with their first son, and they erected the gates with his second son's death. And his reputation shall spread throughout the land. Joshua and the Battle of Jericho is one of the most famous stories in all of the Bible. And I can absolutely guarantee you, before, before I learned how to walk, Mama V was teaching us about Joshua and the Battle of Jericho. And as I've grown older and over the years, much has been said about the size of the city. Historians speculate that there were between 2,000 and 3,000 people living in the city during this time, which may not sound like a lot today. But when you think about surviving on crops, when you think about surviving on grain and cattle, that's not only a lot of mouths to feed, but that's a lot of crops to produce. A lot is said about the size of the city, but even more is said about the walls of Jericho. 
I've got a few pictures that should help illustrate how the walls of Jericho were built. And so I know we kind of have our own depiction or idea of what it looks like. But this is what historians speculate and believe what the city walls of Jericho looked like. You had a lower wall, and then you had an upper wall, and you had archer towers that were erected above those. I believe there's one or two more. This is another angle of what the city of Jericho would have looked like during biblical times. And this is another angle of it. And you can leave this picture up here. You can leave this one up. And the walls were built, as you'll see, on a tiered system. First, it was the boulders. And you'll see the wall erected on top of that with this lower level. And then you'll see the second tier up with the walls erected higher than that. They were intended, the walls were intended to be impenetrable. Bible declares that no one could get out and no one would come in. They were, they were built on a slight angle. I was doing some reading and, and the walls were built on a slight angle so it was difficult for opposing armies to just try to climb the walls. Even if you knew how to get up, it was difficult to climb because they built the walls at a slight angle. Historians believe that the archer towers were about 45 feet in the air. And that the walls are said to have been about between 10 and 20 feet wide. Large enough to drive a car through. So the tops of the walls and the archer towers. If you sat on top of the walls and if you sat in the archer towers, you could see for miles. You could see far above the city. You could see, you could see for miles. Which gave them a clear vantage point over the enemies that were heading towards them. They could see as clear as day who was heading our way because of the structure of our walls and how, how high we built them and how, how wide we built them and how we built the archer towers. We can, we can see from miles on end who's coming our way. But their vantage point wasn't just about what was coming towards them. They could also see what was happening around them. And when I thought about it from that perspective, it lets me know that the, that the city of Jericho had, had a front row seat to the children of Israel crossing the Jordan River. Because their walls were so high and because the archer towers were so high, not only could they see what was coming towards them, they could see what was happening all around them. And what they could see is God holding back the waters of the Jordan River. What they could see is that millions and millions of Israelites crossing over the Jordan River on dry ground. You see, it's one thing, it's one thing to hear about what God did at the Red Sea a few years ago. It's one thing to know or to speculate about what God did at the Red Sea. It's a, it's a whole nother thing to see the spirit of the living God doing it right now, present day, in front of my face. In fact, if you look at what Rahab, the prostitute, said while she was hiding the two Israelites, on the, uh, the spies on her roof in chapter 2, verse 8, this is what she says. Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up to the roof to talk with them. I know the Lord has given you this land, she said. She told them, we are, we are all afraid of you. Everyone in this land is, is in living terror, for we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt, and we know what you did to Sihon and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. No, no wonder, Rahab says, our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. This is what Rahab is saying to the spies that she's hiding on the roof of her house. So much is said about the city, the size of the city of Jericho. Much is said about its population. There's, there's so much said about the size and the structure and the construction of the fortified city and the, and the walls that surround it. Not much is said about the obedience of Joshua. We talk a lot about the walls of Jericho. But not much is said about the obedience of Joshua. And I said it last week and I'll say it again that we don't serve a God of happenstance or coincidence. It wasn't by sheer luck that Joshua served as an apprentice to Moses. 
It wasn't, it wasn't luck. It wasn't chance that landed Joshua at, at the side of Moses as, as his student and as his confidant. Everything that God allowed Joshua to see and hear during the life of Moses was simply a training ground for his promotion to leadership. Everything that God allowed him to experience, every, every problem that he saw Moses navigate through, every decision when he saw Moses climb Mount Sinai, he was right there allowing his shoulder to be a brace for Moses to climb. Everything that he saw God do through Moses was simply a training ground for his promotion and leadership. Every miracle that he saw was, was intended to build his faith. Every act of God that Joshua saw achieved through Moses was, was a memory that God was placing in his mind and in his heart for him to refer back to when he found himself in the same position. I told you last week that the season that you're in now Simply preparation for where God is getting ready to take you. That the season that you're in now is, is simply a training ground for, for where God is about to promote you to. But I want you to know, I want you to know that it wasn't, it wasn't Israel shouting that forced the walls of Jericho to fall. It wasn't Israel shouting that forced the walls of Jericho to fall. It wasn't the blowing of the trumpets that, that forced the walls of Jericho to crumble. And I also want you to know that while you may be in a season of preparation where God is honing your skill set, where God is developing you, where God is pruning you, where God is giving you the skills and, and things necessary to be successful at the next level. I need you to know that the adorning of God's blessings in your life won't, throw, won't flow from a place of skill. It'll flow from a place of obedience. I need you to know That the outpouring of God's blessings, the adorning of God's blessings in your life, and you may think you're blessed right now, you have no clue what God wants to do in you and do through you. God says, the adorning that I want to do in your life, and while, I'm, while I am honing your skill sets, while I am sharpening your ability, David, I need you to know that it's not your skill set that's going to open the windows of heaven. It's your obedience. It's not your skill set. It's not how great you can write. It's not how great you can type. It's not how great you can build. It's not how great you can do. It's not how great any of the other things, how great you can present. It doesn't how great you can teach. God says the adorning of my blessings in your life in this next season will solely come from a place of obedience. So a couple points I want to make and then I'll, I'll take my seat. And point number one is this. It's that Joshua knew that his success in Jericho wasn't a result of his leadership. It was a result of his obedience. Joshua knew it. Joshua absolutely knew it. How do I know? I'll, I'll prove it to you. Joshua 1, verse 6 says, Be strong and courageous. And this is God talking to Joshua. For you are the one who will lead these people to possess all the land I swore to their ancestors I would give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Be careful to obey all the instructions Moses gave you. Do not deviate from them, turning either to the right or to the left. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Then you will be successful in everything you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything written in it. Only then, this is God talking to Joshua, only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. Study this book of instruction continually. Meditate on it day and night so you will be sure to obey everything 
written in it. Only then will you prosper and succeed in all you do. It wasn't his skill set in leadership. I go to conferences all the time. I sit in meetings all the time. I have trainings all the time on leadership. God says, it's not my leadership leadership skills that will take me to the next place, that will adorn me with the blessings in this next season. He says, it's simply my obedience to him. And God is saying the same thing for you. I know you're great at what you do. I, I know you've honed the craft. I know you, you've crafted the skill set. I know that you're good at it. I, I know you get patted on the back all the time for what you do in the workplace. But I need you to know that your success will come from your obedience to this. That's what God says. Joshua knew from day one that my success won't come from how well my soldiers train. Our success won't come from how sharp our swords are. Our success won't come from how well we navigate battlefields. My success comes from our ability to be obedient to this. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is what takes priority in my life? How many trainings have I sat in on leadership versus how many hours have I spent reading this? And the Bible goes a step further and say, be ye, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. It ain't good enough just to read it. You're just reading God's word. You're lumping up curses for yourself, reading it and not being obedient to it. God says the success that you experience in this next season of life has nothing to do with your skill set. And I know that's hard for most of us who have spent decades and decades honing our skill set thinking that it's our skill set that's going to get us what we need at the next level. And God says, no, 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 no. season that you're about to walk into and you have no idea how richly I want to bless you. I want to send you through some walls that are deemed impenetrable. I want to send you into some, into some cities. I want to give you some things. I want to open some doors that look like they're so bolted shut you'd never be able to get into them. But God says, it will not happen if you're not obedient to my word. Point number two. I know y'all ready for me to shut up. Point number two. Point number two is this. What the enemy intended. And I know these are long points. They're supposed to be like short and crafty, but whatever. What the enemy intended. (laughs) What the enemy intended to use. I was writing them and I'm like, man, that's long. Um, What the enemy intended to use to block you from your blessing can be the very thing God can use to propel you. The reason why that's point number two. Can you put the picture back up? This one. Is historians and excavators did some digging around the city of Jericho. And what they found, and this is so amazing, what they found, and you see it even depicted in the pictures, is that as the children of Israel begin to shout, The walls of Jericho fell forward. And you see it depicted here. And so what happened is, is the walls that were deemed to be impenetrable created a ramp for the children of Israel to enter the city. And so the very walls that were intended to keep them out became the ramp that they needed to get in. And you see it happen in these various places. And they didn't have to climb. All they had to do was go up a ramp. And the very thing that God was saying is is that the very thing that the enemy has intended to be an impenetrable wall in your life, God says, I have the power to make that very thing become a ramp to the the places that I want to take you to next. And we're looking at some things and we're looking at some people and we're looking at some places and some positions and some cities and saying, I'll never be able to get there. I'll I'll never be able to break through. I'll never be able to to get in there. I'll never be able to get that big, that large of a contract with the city or, or with this company. And God says, the very things that are deemed impenetrable in your life are the absolute things that I want to use as a ramp to carry you to your next level. Point number three. Point number three is this. And whoever is following me next should make their way to the front. Point number three is this, is that Joshua learned. Joshua learned from the failures of Moses. 
And this is an important one. Joshua spent decades with Moses. Joshua spent decades learning and watching and seeing miracle after miracle performed through Moses. Do you know how devastating it was when Joshua found out that Moses wasn't making it into the promised land because of disobedience? The man that I've spent my life walking after, the man that I've spent assisting and helping, the man that I've spent learning from, can't even step foot in the promised land that he spent the last 80 years of his life trying to get us into. And I believe that Joshua looked at the life of Moses and he said, I can't allow disobedience to keep me from the promises of God. And what does that mean? That means that there's some folk around me. There's some mentors. There are some people that are trying to speak into my life and are trying to share some of their failures. And shame on me if I don't le learn from the failures of others. Shame on me if I look at the great Moses have to sit on top of a hill and all he can do is view what the promised land looks like and I go and follow in the same path. Same on me if I allow disobedience to keep me from everything that God has promised for my life. I believe wholeheartedly that Joshua learned failure and the impact of disobedience from the life of Moses. The ornament of obedience. Jericho wasn't achieved through skill. Jericho wasn't achieved through great warfare. Jericho wasn't to great military mindsets. Jericho was, was conquered because this was the position of Joshua. God, whatever you say, I'll obey. God, I know I look foolish walking around this city, but if that's what you told me to do and to keep quiet, God, then that's what we'll do. God says your success your promotion in the next season won't come from this. Won't come from these. It'll come from a position of obedience. Of obedience. And I don't know what the promises of God for your life. I don't claim to know them all. I don't know what doors God is looking. God is looking bust down. I don't know what walls he's, he's looking to destroy. But what I do know is this. Obedience to this is the source of your next promotion. Wherever that is, whatever that is source of your next promotion lies in your obedience to this. God, we thank you for your love and kindness and for your tender mercies. God, I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you for the conviction. I thank you for the correction. I thank you for the challenge. I thank you for the chastisement. I thank you for the rebuking. I thank you for the reminding. I thank you for the purifying. I thank you, God, what type of father loves those but doesn't punish sometimes when necessary, doesn't correct when necessary. I thank you for the correction. I thank you for the reminder. A sobering word, but a yet an encouraging word, God, because it lets me know that if I just submit my life to you, that nothing is impossible when the enemy meant for good. The schemes and plots and attacks of the enemy, the walls that he's created around my life that he thought were, were impenetrable. God, he says nothing is too hard for him. God, may your will and your word be perfected and performed in our life. We submit to you, Holy Spirit, mind, body, soul, and spirit, even now. I 
pray that you're penetrating our hearts and our minds. I, I pray that, God, your word is doing surgery in our hearts, even now. That we'll walk out of here changed. That we'll walk out of here wanting to be different. That we'll walk out of here with a desire, God, to know you more intimately, to spend some time at your feet. That we'll start converting rooms in our house to prayer closets. spend some intimate time at your feet God. and we'll fall in love with your word in a manner which we never have before we'll see the manifestation of the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our life I thank you God because what you said tonight isn't anything new your word says in Matthew 6 and 33 seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these things will be added unto you God you don't contradict yourself Thank you for the power of your word. The Holy Spirit, do what you only you can do. God, we'll be so careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. In Jesus' mighty name.